Morning guys, uh, good to see you all here. My name is Andy and the clinical lead here at ReadyCare. There's my little name tag, there it is. Um, so in today's session, we're gonna get a little bit technical. We kind of go between Chloe with the kind of neuroscience side of things that I'm more the physiology and bio biological at least, uh, I was gonna say biology side of things. So what we'll be talking about today is a complex topic. It, it's quite complex, but I'm gonna break it down. We'll go into the kind of deeper science uh, and then pull it back and just talk about the practical implications of the research of the last seven or eight years in particular as it pertains to what's known as lipidology so heart health before i forget to say it because i always do please like and subscribe to the video i know it's only a local channel for people who are on the program but it does help in terms of knowing what content people like um, and if anyone has any questions just pop it into the youtube or the um, comments section if you're joining via stream here okay so without further ado let's start i just want to share something with you very quickly just before we uh, go on to do you know all the ins and outs around cholesterol i just want to talk about the fact that we've been studying this stuff quite deeply as a as a kind of a um a passion for the last certainly i have for the last eight or nine years in particular and a lot of the content that i'd say today would be counterintuitive and it's really important to acknowledge that this is just not a, a notion that i've had or an idea uh, this is something that we have strong evidence from the patients three or four hundred patients that we've published on over the last seven or eight years. Um, this is an International Scholar Award from the American Heart Association, acknowledging our work in the area of cardiometabolic disease. So we deeply understand the ins and outs of cardiometabolic disease, how heart disease happens, and particularly as it relates to the role of cholesterol. So let's address the elephant in the room before we get going. The previously held belief around cholesterol was there is cholesterol in food. If you eat that high cholesterol food and high fat food, it somehow clogs up your arteries, almost like as if we're dishwashers or washing machines. That it just goes in, clogs up the pipes, and that's how you get heart disease. Now we know cholesterol is very much so an innocent bystander in the sense that where there is systemic inflammation or an insult to your artery lining known as the subentima in along here, cholesterol comes along to try and repair uh, as opposed to just clogging it up for the crack if that makes sense so what are the key drivers of inflammation is the next question and the answer to that is sugar processed carbohydrate industrial seed, seed oils emulsifiers smoking alcohol and chemical pollutants not dietary cholesterol not saturated fat the evidence is overwhelmingly clear we've been barking up the wrong tree okay with that let's just take a quick look at this, which is really interesting. So this is just one of the key pieces of research over the last number of years. This is actually as far back as 2010. This is the largest ever meta-analysis on saturated fat and heart health. So a meta-analysis, for anyone who's not familiar with the term, is basically an analysis of multiple high-level randomized control trials. Randomized control trials are the highest level uh, study, level of study that you can do. And Again, to break down that term, RCT or randomized control trials means I take a thousand patients, uh, split them into two groups of 500. I put one group on a vegan diet, the other group on a carnivore diet, and they're randomized into these groups. They're not choosing them. Um, it's not the one that they prefer to do, they're randomized. And then you can do what's known as a, a double blind crossover, where if you're giving people pills, for example, neither group knows what they're on. So they're the, the terms that you'd hear in science, randomized control trial and double blind crossover study. Um, so this is the largest ever meta-analysis. So they looked at the 30 or 40 studies on saturated fat and really examined them properly to see, are we saying that saturated fat clogs up your arteries because people who eat the most saturated fat get the most heart disease? Or is it something else they're eating? Is it the fact that when they're having red meat or when they're having eggs, they're also having milkshakes and chocolate and, you know, sugar and the diet and sweets and things like that? Or is it just a saturated fat? And this is the largest ever meta-analysis of what they call prospective studies showed that there is no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease. So the next time you're looking at a low fat diet and it's labeled as a skinny yogurt or a, and by the way, anything labeled as um, low sugar or low calorie or low fat is, is probably not good for you because it's processed food by virtue of the fact that it has a label on it in the first place. Personally, 90% of my shopping is, or I, I try to have it be, um, you know, meat, eggs, cheese, fruits, vegetables. This is 90% of my shopping. O over and above, we'd say coffees and teas and toiletries and stuff like that. Okay. 
this is a really interesting one. So this is just looking at the um, correlation between high cholesterol and heart disease. So this is a paper, a new national study actually, showing that, and, and this one I want you to really um, internalize and remember the next time you're talking to someone who says, oh, your cholesterol is high, you should lower it with medication, which has been the previously held belief for that, and the current paradigm by 95% plus of doctors. So this national study in the UK showed that, sorry, in the US, excuse me, the UCLA, showed that 75% of patients hospitalized for a heart attack had cholesterol levels that were normal, non-high risk, i.e. below five, and their LDL level, previously referred to as bad cholesterol, wasn't even high. So we now understand that the vast majority of people who have heart attacks have, quote unquote, normal cholesterol levels. This flies completely in the face of those who still um, repeat the, the rhetoric and the old school public health guidelines that your cholesterol should be below five, and if it's not, you should go on a medication to lower it. So I just wanted to, to kind of break down. Sometimes people say to me, well, why do they still say that you shouldn't eat much cholesterol so in order to prevent heart disease? Well, they don't. We repeat that as a sort of a mantra and almost a truism now. Well, you shouldn't eat too many eggs if, if you have high cholesterol. And it's funny, whenever I meet someone who um, kind of at least gives me an idea that they know what they're talking about or, or, or claims to know what they're talking about with this stuff, they'll say to me, well, you shouldn't eat eggs if you have high cholesterol. And I'd say, why? And they say, because they have cholesterol in them. And I say, yeah. And they go, well, you know, you shouldn't eat cholesterol if you have high cholesterol. And I say, why? And they can't, they just, it's just a loop. They can't explain it. They have no idea. They're just repeating something that's been parted over the years. So the 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines, after reviewing all the science of the last 20 or 30 years, after noticing that heart attacks are exponentially increasing despite the fact that we're eating significantly less saturated fat and cholesterol, came to the conclusion that they're going to, these are the 2015 to 2020, what are known as um, the, a, what is it, ADGA or something like that. Anyway, the dietary guidelines for the USDA, that's what it is, USDA dietary guidelines for Americans, have removed the recommendations of restricting dietary cholesterol to 300 milligrams per day. So basically they're saying that, although we used to think before that eating a lot of, um, you know, things like eggs and seafood and red meat because they contain cholesterol would just clog up your arteries. We see no evidence to um, keep that limit in place. So this, again, is just more evidence over the last number of years. This guy in the picture here is Professor Thomas Dayspring. He's probably the world's leading expert in all things cholesterol. And his conclusion from all of the recent literature was that, and this is going to be hard to get our heads around, but High LDL cholesterol, LDL just means low density lipoprotein. It's the one that your doctors will, broadly speaking, most doctors will incorrectly refer to as uh, bad cholesterol because that's what we used to believe it was. High LDL is inversely associated with mortality in most people over 60. So let me break down that because these studies use these kind of fancy terminology. High bad cholesterol makes you likely to live longer. High LDL cholesterol is inversely associated with mortality, with dying in most people over 60. That is, the higher your LDL cholesterol, and LDL feeds into your total number, by the way. So the higher your total number and the higher your LDL number, the less likely you are to have a heart attack. But it's with mortality. So to have a heart attack, to have cancer, to have stroke, dementia, all those sort of things, anything that can lead to premature death. And their commentary was that this finding is inconsistent with the cholesterol hypothesis so that cholesterol, and particularly bad cholesterol, is inherently atherogenic. And inherently atherogenic means it's just automatically clogging up your arteries, which we know now it's not. Since elderly people with high bad cholesterol live as long or longer than those with low bad cholesterol, our analysis provides reason to question the validity of this whole cholesterol hypothesis. So Professor Thomas Dayspring had a comment a couple of years ago where he said that the, the current NHANES, that NHANES is just a, a national database of um, everyone who's had a heart attack, and, or lots, sorry, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who have heart, have heart attacks. And he reckons that the data shows the majority of heart attacks, MI is myocardial infarctions, are due to insulin resistance. So high levels of sugar in your blood from processed food, not from dietary cholesterol itself. And the real message is that unless your LDL is over 5.3 millimoles, it's a terrible biomarker for predicting heart disease. So we shouldn't be focusing on LDL or total cholesterol, but there are two parts of your cholesterol we should be focusing in line with the 
research of the last number of years, last decade in particular. Now, I won't bore you with these, but there are numerous studies showing that if you put people on a low-fat diet for a prolonged period of time, it increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. It doesn't reduce it. Two reasons for that. One, saturated fat does not clog up your arteries. It's not, as I quoted, inherently atherogenic, nor is dietary cholesterol. Makes sense if you think about the way your grandparents ate and the way remote tribes around the world have eaten for uh, thousands upon thousands of years. In fact, hundreds of thousands. Um, the second reason for it is that where you focus solely on reducing fat and cholesterol and calories in your diet, the consequences of that are that you inadvertently end up eating way more processed carbohydrate and sugar. So if your way of deciding whether a food is good to eat or not is to look at low calorie, low fat, you end up eating something with 80 ingredients in it that you can't pronounce that's just absolute terrible crap. And the food industry couldn't care less about your health. I mean, there's all sorts of corruption and, and I won't get into it too much because I sound like a bit of a conspiracy theorist and it's not the idea of today's talk. But I mean, you've got the likes of heart healthy stamps put on foods that are definitely, definitely driving chronic disease like breakfast cereals and sugary granola bars and, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. So th there is a lot of corruption, so it's hard to trust labeling. But I promise you this, if you look at food and decide if it's got more than three or four ingredients, it might be dangerous for me. And if I stick to meat, eggs, cheese, above ground vegetables, uh, berries, you know, all that sort of real food, you're going to be just so much more healthy, so much more healthy. Um, so this is the Sydney Diet Heart Study, which showed that reducing saturated fat in the diet and increasing things like um, canola oil, one calorie sprays, increase the risk in the study population of death by 62%. This is available evidence from the Minnesota coronary experiment going back decades ago when they reanalyzed it, basically found the same thing. And then you have to answer the question, well, where is the heart disease epidemic in remote tribes around the world? And this is really important because sometimes people like to say, well, maybe this is not true. Maybe they're exercising more and that's why they can get away with eating all that saturated fat and cholesterol. Not true. The data around the prevalence of cancer, heart disease, stroke, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and premature death in these remote populations and remote tribes is independent of activity status, meaning if they don't exercise, if they stay home and take care of the kids, if they're elderly or infirm, if they've had an accident and they can't walk, they do not get those same chronic diseases. And the other idea that's often put forward as a retort to this stuff is that, well, maybe they're just sort of some genetic anomaly. Maybe they don't get sick because they have such strong genes. And that's definitely incorrect. They're actually more likely to get sick because they haven't had any sort of adaptation to sugar and processed food in the diet. There was a great study a couple of years ago where they brought a group of, I believe they were Canadian or maybe they were Russian Inuits, but anyway, a group of Inuits, maybe 50 or 60 of them, which we would have previously referred to incorrectly, um, or certainly has changed as Eskimos. So they brought them over to some part in the States. The study was supposed to go on for two years to see if they eat a bit more processed food, are they so resilient that they don't get sick? And they had to call the study off within three or four months because they were getting depressed, sick, suicidal, fatty liver, pre-diabetic, gaining so much weight, teeth were starting to rot. All the stuff that we see in the Western world was happening to them two or three times faster than it happens us. Okay, so... If cholesterol is not the enemy, what should we be looking at within our lipid profile? And one thing has emerged that's very, very obvious. If you look at your cholesterol profile, I can tell nine times out of 10 when somebody walks in, if I'm doing a health assessment, if someone is carrying a lot of weight around the midsection and they're telling me their energy is not great and they do eat a lot of processed food, I can tell one thing for sure. They're going to have low HDL and they're going to have high triglycerides. When your blood sugar levels go high from eating sugar, processed carbohydrate, any carbohydrate really if you overdo it um and, and the stuff a lot of us eat you're going to get high levels of a hormone called insulin in the body and insulin is the driver of what's known as dyslipidemia low hdl and high triglycerides so if you're listening from one of our corporates and you have a health report check out your hdl number if it's below 1.3 that's not good if it's above 1.3 that is good so hdl is high density lipoprotein often referred to as good cholesterol which is not entirely accurate but it is mostly good so you want your good cholesterol to be as high as possible ideally above 1.3 and the higher the better and you want your triglycerides which are fats in the blood nothing to do with dietary fat actually happens when you overconsume sugar and carbs 
you want your triglycerides to be as low as possible, ideally below one. That would be amazing. Below one triglycerides and HDL above 1.3 would be great. The things that contribute to high triglycerides, which are the bad ones, alcohol, sugar, processed food, and fruit, interestingly enough, particularly high sugar fruits like bananas, grapes, and so on. So definitely dial down if you have high triglycerides, dial down tropical fruit, dial down alcohol, and eat less processed carbohydrate. And this is very uh, contrary to, or, or, or in contrast, I should say, with total cholesterol and LDL in terms of its predictive value for heart disease. These are very, very, very predictive. Okay, so this is one of my favorite studies ever um, over the last, and I read at least five or 10 a day. This is done, um, I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago. It was done on middle-aged men in uh, the Middle East. And what they did was they enrolled eight or 9,000 men who'd had a heart attack in the previous year. And what they did was they tracked their blood and they said, of all the things that we're going to track in your blood, the 50 or 60 things, which ones are the most predictive in um, indicating when you're going to have a second heart attack? So if you'd had a heart attack and your cholesterol was... 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, there was no top number. No matter how high it went, it did not increase your risk of heart disease. I say that again because this is um, really busts the myth and the, the thing you'll hear from all sorts of professionals, or you want to keep your cholesterol low. You don't actually. In fact, I prefer when my cholesterol is kind of 6 or 7. But what you do want to keep low are your blood sugar levels. So if your cholesterol level was 3 or your cholesterol level was 10, it did not confer an increased risk of heart disease. If your quote unquote bad cholesterol, the one we used to call bad cholesterol LDL, if that was above four or five or six, it didn't increase your risk of heart disease. In fact, LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol were more or less harmless. They did nothing in terms of increasing your risk of heart disease. If your blood pressure was high consistently, it increased your risk of heart disease. That's, that's old news, we know that. Now, if your insulin levels were high, you were at a 670% increased risk of having heart disease, which is colossal. That basically means if your risk of a second heart attack was 10%, it was now 67%. If it was 5%, it was now 35 odd percent or 40. So it's through the roof. And why is this important? Or how does this relate to the way we eat today? Well, insulin is the hormone that your pancreas secretes when you overconsume processed carbohydrate or sugar. If you eat fat or protein, your body produces barely any insulin. When you eat protein, your pancreas has a what you can refer to as a kind of a pulsatile um, release of insulin. It just pulses a little bit in a kind of a, an ordinary fashion. If you eat fat, it doesn't cause insulin to go up at all, interestingly enough. If you eat cornflakes, porridge, potatoes, bananas, cereal, Ben & Jerry's, frozen pizzas, granola bars, all that sort of stuff, white, white rolls, brown rolls, actually, for that matter, brown bread, all that processed carbohydrate that we've been eating for the last 30 or 40 years insulin will be elevated. And when insulin is chronically elevated, it significantly increases your risk of heart disease. So I brought together this slide here because they just wanted to, I'll come back on that. I just wanted to illustrate a point here. It's very clear from the clinical literature of the last eight or nine years that we've been barking up the wrong tree. We've been chasing total cholesterol. We've been getting people to take cholesterol lowering drugs. We've been looking at total cholesterol. We've had food guidelines that have said eat less cholesterol. And all the time, what we should have been looking at is weight around the midsection, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, and low HDL, which all form something called insulin resistance. So I want to talk about how we can alter our cholesterol level to, to minimize our risk of heart disease significantly. So this will sound uh, totally counterintuitive, but these foods are the foods that you want to eat less of to lower your cholesterol. So before I go into it just for one second, this is just an important one to talk about for a second. So what happens when your insulin level, remember I said the pancreas secretes insulin when you eat sugar and carbohydrate. What happens when your insulin levels go high? It increases your triglycerides. Uh, triglycerides are fats in the liver. Now it might sound unusual to say, I have fat in my liver and I have fat in my blood. And the answer to that is to eat more fat. Sounds totally counterintuitive, I totally acknowledge that but we've seen this time and time again in our clinical studies of patients. Your triglycerides don't go up because you're eating fat, no more than your cholesterol goes up because you're eating cholesterol. Cholesterol builds up and fat in your, in your liver and your blood goes up because there's metabolic function caused by eating, dysfunction, excuse me, caused by eating sugar and processed food. 
So when insulin levels go high from eating lots of sugar, the pancreas secretes insulin to keep sugar under control. When insulin is chronically elevated, your triglycerides go up and your HDL goes down. You get this seesaw effect in your lipid profile. And you also get more of what are known as atherogenic small LDL particles. So um, that's when your LDL goes bad is when your sugar levels are high, not just because you're eating cholesterol. So based on everything that we know of the last 10 or 12 years, the foods to avoid to, I use the word intentionally here and strategically, optimize your cholesterol level, not lower your cholesterol because it may not be favorable to just lower your cholesterol level. Foods to avoid or eat less of to optimize your cholesterol level. And again, optimize means increase your HDL and lower your triglycerides. Breads of all descriptions. Are brown breads marginally better than white? Yes, but the operative word there is marginally. Rice and pasta, again, whole grain is a better marginally, but I personally avoid it. Breakfast cereals, with the exception of maybe a low-carb granola recipe that you make yourself. Um, fizzy drinks, and the science, actually, I'll touch on it for a second round. Fizzy drinks is very interesting. We know now that there is a direct dose-dependent relationship between aspartum, the sweetener, and cancer. So the more diet drinks that you drink, the more likely you are to get cancer. That is black and white clear. New paper out there over the last couple of weeks. So although it might be an okay alternative once or twice a week, personally, I choose to avoid it. It kills me because I love Diet Coke, but I choose to avoid it for that reason. Um, starchy vegetables, although we ate them, we listen, I was going to say we ate them, we survived on them as a nation for the longest time. But if you're eating these and your cholesterol level is already out of sync, which it wouldn't be if you were just eating potatoes and meat, but if you if you had a, a processed food diet and now you have low HDL, high triglycerides, dial down on things like starchy vegetables, cakes, pastries, grain-based foods, and so on. And again, counterintuitively, eat more meat, eggs, cheese, full fat, everything. Do not go low fat. Anytime um, you see low fat in chemical store, anytime, because um, almost every time you, you're going to end up with, um, you know, more sugar, more emulsifiers, which is kind of like a glue, more processed crap jumped into it to make it palatable and, and taste nicer. Red meat does not increase your risk of cancer, despite the highly flawed, awful epidemiological studies. There's no objective in part of clinical literature of the last 40 or 50 years, nor will there ever be to show that red meat gives you cancer because it doesn't. Uh, fish and seafood, eggs, nuts, seeds, avocado, and so on, real butter, and full fat dairy. Let me see, do I have a case study here? No, but look at loads, loads and loads of evidence. But basically, when you increase healthy fat and follow a low carb or ketogenic diet, this is what you can expect. You can expect your triglycerides to go way down, your HDL, and by way down, I mean about 50% typically. An increase in HDL, which is your good cholesterol, your total or bad cholesterol may go up or down. That doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, you see weight loss, blood pressure reductions, and so on. So I suppose the key takeaway from today, guys, is that the literature has changed dramatically. And you might ask the question, well, why have all the food guidelines changed? That is, I promise you that's not how it works. There's so many vested interests in nutrition, uh, pharma, big food, that it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And, and companies will play to what the average person knows. So they'll go, oh, proven to lower your cholesterol, as if that's automatically a good thing. And it's just not. Um, so, I mean, it ultimately comes back to this. If we look at the, the clinical literature of the last 10 years or so, every single thing I read that's of high quality is pointing to the same thing. And that is that God or nature, evolution, whatever you believe in, had a plan. It turns out, like a friend of mine says, it turns out that Mother Nature is not a psychopath. Foods that are presented to us in nature, like fruits, vegetables, fish and meat, are not just trying to kill us. You know, they're not just trying to clog up our arteries and kill us. And actually, what we've done is we have um, we've managed to somehow point the finger at meat and eggs and ancient ancestral foods when really we're blaming them for what processed food was doing in the background. Okay, I'll take a couple of questions here. Um, Daniel, this is a great question actually. So is sodium bad for you, like foods with a high salt content? And is soy sauce better or worse for you, even the low sodium ones? So what's really interesting, um, actually, let me give me two seconds and I'll answer this question really thoroughly here now, because I've done a couple of presentations on this as it happens. Can I find, do, 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 one second then, I'll just see if I can find the literature on this. And if not, I'll cover it anyway. 
no, sorry, I don't, I don't have the slides loaded. Okay, so basically, Daniel, um, there is a, a U-curve response between sodium intake and heart disease, meaning if your sodium intake is really low, then you're at a really low, uh, excuse me, really high risk of heart disease if, you, if you're eating no salt at all. Totally counterintuitive, even though the old school advice would have said high sodium is bad. As you increase your sodium intake, your risk gets lower and lower and lower and lower. And lower. As you go really high in salt intake, the, increase, the risk starts to go up and up and up again. So there was a misinterpretation of the literature, but there was a really big paper in the New England Journal of Medicine three or four years ago that showed countries with the highest intake of sodium, which is by a country mile, Japan and China, have the lowest intake of heart disease. Now, heart disease is multifaceted. There's loads of things going on outside of just sodium. But certainly um, the evidence that we've seen where we've told patients you can increase your sodium intake once it's kind of pink Himalayan rock salt as opposed to the plasticky um, table salt that you get that has plastic contaminants and chemicals in it because of the way it's produced and washed. Increase your risk of um, the pink Himalayan rock salt and decrease your risk of processed foods you see a reduction in blood pressure that outperforms blood pressure medication. So I'll say that again, the patient on our program, we instructed them to either keep the same or, or increase their salt intake, but eat way less sugar and processed carbohydrate. Their blood pressure reduced more than if they were on a blood pressure medication. So personally, I heavily salt my food. Um, Hilary, uh, hi Andy, thanks for that. Can you remind me again, what's the good number following cholesterol blood test? The good high number, sure. So your HDL cholesterol, Hilary, should be above 1.3 um, and ideally above 1.5, that would be great. And Chloe, hi Andy, what foods can you recommend for vegetarian like carb replacements to feel full? It can be difficult, Chloe, because the... Um, vegetarian diets if you're vegetarian there's lots of things you can have like beans pulses legumes which are carbohydrate based foods but they're much better than the the kind of white pasta white rice that sort of stuff and even just swapping out um the protein that you would see in our resource packs for you know corn tofu any of that sort of stuff it's the corn is not great actually it's called a, it's a micro protein it's pretty processed um but basically the idea with a meal in terms of so you use the word full this is really interesting the fullness hormone, there's two of them. One of them is ghrelin, G-H-R-E-L-A-N, and the other hormone is known as GLP-1. Now, GLP-1 is the one that you'll, um, you'll hear a lot about in the news because people are injecting themselves in the stomach to lose weight with this chemical. GLP-1 goes under the brand name Ozempic, we go over uh, Cidagliptin, there's loads of different names. Um, sorry, Cidagliptin is a different brand of medication. Anyway, the ones that the Kardashians and every second celebrity are pr pr supposed to be injecting themselves with it, although I don't believe it. Um, GLP-1 is produced naturally in the body when you eat protein. So any type of protein, if you're vegetarian, the best type by a mile if you eat, eat it would be eggs. By a mile, animal protein is absorbed at a way more high uh, bioavailable level than plant-based protein. So you'll hear people saying, well, beans have the same amount of protein as uh, beef. It's not absorbed the same way. And if you really want to feel full, up the amount of protein in your diet. So that could be Greek yogurt. It could be um, cheese, mozzarella cheese, any type of cheese at all, uh, or it could be something like eggs, or even putting a bit of whey protein powder into a smoothie or something like that. But focus on protein if you want to feel full. The more protein you take in, the less calories you take in every time, every time. So protein has a very high, what they call satiety profile. And a good way to kind of um, envisage that is, if someone said to you, I want you to eat 6,000 calories and I'll give you 10 grand, you would say, okay, I'll try it. And if I said to you, I want you to eat a 12-inch pizza with a tub of Ben & Jerry's, we'd all do it. But you wouldn't eat 16 chicken breasts. And they're the same amount of calories. So the caloric value of something only has so much information in it. The amount of protein in it is hugely important when it comes to being full. So hopefully that helps. And by the way, Chloe, if you look up online, if you look up low-carb vegetarian recipes, there are websites dedicated to just that. Keto or low-carb, K-E-T-O. Guys, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being with me this morning. Um, I'm off to make more videos on this sort of stuff and putting together a CPD course for clinicians at the moment, which is great fun. Um, thanks for joining me. We'll be back next week. I think it is me back next week talking about ice baths and how they can transform your immune system, your anxiety and depression levels and your overall health and body fat levels. Have a good day and I will see you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.